Hello everyone. Today we're going to review a survey of abdominal wall abnormalities. Learning objectives are to learn to identify diagnoses which commonly appear on QA lists, identify abdominal wall abnormalities encountered in the emergency setting, and use abdominal wall findings to aid in other common diagnoses that one encounters in the emergency setting. One of the things I like about abdominal wall findings is the additional history it provides when you know where to look. First case is the typical postoperative appearance of a lipoabdominoplasty. So lipoabdominoplasty is the common combination of a tummy tuck with liposuction. So the abdominoplasty portion of the lipoabdominoplasty is quite extensive with a large hip-to-hip -hip incision, release of the umbilicus, midline muscle plication, resection of redundant skin, and skin closure. And a lipoabdominoplasty combines all of that in addition to liposuction. The midline crowding of the erectus abdominis muscles is the imaging giveaway that the patient has undergone the procedure. And once you learn to see it, you'll realize just how common it is. Here, the red circle shows the typical midline crowding of the erectus abdominis muscles. And the green arrows demonstrate the liposuction cannula tracts. The most common complication of this procedure is a seroma, which usually occurs in the second or third postoperative week and can be seen in 10 to 20% of cases. Other common complications would be hematoma, necrosis of the dermal fat flap, and wound infection. On these cases, also remember to keep an eye out for incidental DVT or PE, which can occur at a rate of 0.04% and 0.02% respectively. Here's the full scan showing the extent of the postoperative changes in this patient with a distant prior history of lipoabdominoplasty. The red circle follows the course of the midline crowding of the rectus abdominis muscles, while the green arrows outline the liposuction cannula tracts. Keep in mind that in the early postoperative period, the expected degree of fluid and stranding along the course of the liposuction cannula tracts would overlap considerably with the appearance of cellulitis. Always keep an eye out for fluid collections that may be not enhancing seromas or enhancing abscesses. In the early postoperative setting, the most lethal complication would be venous thromboembolism and abdominal perforation. Abdominal perforation because the liposuction cannulas are inserted blind and can puncture into the abdominal cavity. Our next case is an example of free silicone injection. Here, this axial image shows the typical postoperative appearance of liquid silicone injection. These multiple round densities in the gluteal soft tissues are silicone granulomas. Keep in mind these can calcify or be confluent. You can pretty much see these anywhere, but breasts and buttocks are the most common. Also note the midline crowding of the rectus abdominal muscles, signaling a prior abdominoplasty. Just a few words on the history of free silicone. Medical grade liquid silicone is strictly regulated by the FDA and basically only legal for abdominal procedures like retinal detachment. So pretty much any case of liquid silicone injection was done either a long time ago on the black market in the United States or as part of medical tourism in another country. Because of these non-standard conditions, these patients are at high risk for cellulitis, abscess, and myositis. Before outlawed in Nevada in 1975, approximately 20,000 to 40,000 women were injected with non-medical grade silicone in the United States, which is usually adulterated with peanut oil, olive oil, or cobra venom in an attempt to limit silicone migration. The axial clip shows the abdominal plasty and the innumerable silicone granulomas in the gluteal soft tissues. A differential consideration would include gluteal fat injections, which could also be complicated by infection, and you may see a fat pus level in these round lesions, indicative of abscess, as opposed to these more uniform silicone densities. 
Remember to keep an eye out for cellulitis, abscess, and silicone migration. Our next case is cellulitis following lipoabdominoplasty. This patient underwent lipoabdominoplasty and autologous fat transfer in addition to liposuction. We start again with our post-abdominoplasty findings, this midline crowding of the rectus muscles outlined in a red circle here. Our typical appearance of the liposuction cannula tracts. Then as we move caudally, we see that, that the area of the fat grafting, there is extensive subcutaneous edema and skin thickening. So here is where the fat is going. And the edema and skin thickening are compatible with the clinically diagnosed cellulitis. The full axial clip shows evidence of multiple prior procedures, starting here with the partially imaged left breast prosthesis. We then see the abdominoplasty, liposuction cannula tracts, and the edema involving the gluteal fat grafting. There is no fluid collection or soft tissue gas here. Keep in mind that lipo injection can be performed as a combination of subcutaneous, subdermal, and intramuscular injections. And complications can occur at any of these levels. Our next case is abscess following lipoabdominoplasty. So there's a lot going on in a single axial slice from a contrast enhanced CT, but I hope you're starting to recognize that we see evidence of a prior abdominoplasty here with the typical crowding of the erectus muscles in the midline. And as we move further down, we see multiple peripherally enhancing fluid collections, which contain foci of air compatible with abscesses. Anteriorly, we see the smaller collection overlying the left iliac crest at the site of the ventral incision, and posteriorly along the liposuction cannula tract, we see a larger abscess. The full cine clip shows, again, evidence of multiple prior procedures, including breast prosthesis. As you proceed further down, you see the extensive subcutaneous edema in this recent post-operative patient who underwent abdominoplasty with liposuction. Like you mentioned earlier, the early post operative appearance can overlap significantly with cellulitis, but here the peripherally enhancing fluid collection one sees bilaterally along the lateral margins of the ventral surgical incision and posteriorly along the liposuction cannula tracts contain multiple foci of air, clinching the diagnosis of post operative abscesses. Moving away from cosmetic procedures, and on to obstetrics briefly. In this single axial image from a contrast enhanced CT scan in a patient with recent cesarean section, we see separation of the rectus abdominis muscles with herniation of multiple loops of non distended, non obstructive small bowel through the abdominal wall defect, compatible with fascial dehiscence. The full image set shows the extent of the rectus abdominis separation in the midline at the level of the linea alba. Note that the skin remains closed. So this is not a superficial wound dehiscence. Here is a patient with an enhancing umbilical mass shown here outlined in a red circle. When I was reading this case, this is the first thing that jumped out at me, that this patient might have a history of malignancy. No history of malignancy was initially provided, so this was an important discovery. Once this finding was made, all these other peritoneal implants started to jump out at me, like these in the left lower quadrant and here in the right lower quadrant. This finding is known as the Sister Mary Joseph nodule, which, as far as eponyms go, 
has an interesting story all its own, and I recommend you taking a look at the backstory, especially since it's one of the few eponyms that's not named after a physician. The cine clip shows the extent of meniscite disease in this patient. Now, these findings are not difficult to make, but without the history of malignancy and in the setting of the emergency department, some of these can be quite subtle. Out of mind, out of sight. There are many implants here, some of which you see highlighted in green. This brings me to the broader point of adding the abdominal wall and soft tissues to a dedicated search pattern, which is the additional history it tends to provide. This may take the form of a soft tissue contusion in a patient without a provided history of trauma, recent surgical incisions in a patient with indeterminate free air, or in this case, the first tip off to widespread metastatic disease in this patient with metastatic ovarian cancer. In this young patient with right gluteal pain, we see subcutaneous serpiginous densities with scattered calcifications, no definite enhancement. The full axial stack shows the multiple abnormal tortuous vessels in the right gluteal soft tissues, which communicate with intramuscular vessels. Tiny calcifications indicate flebolus, indicating this is a slow flow lesion. These have no malignant potential and do not typically relapse after surgical incision. In this trauma patient with a history of crushing injury, we see extensive subcutaneous soft tissue contusion. As we move further down, we see a focus of contrast density in the subcutaneous soft tissues compatible with active hemorrhage, and the density matches the arterial phase, so this is likely an arterial hemorrhage. And this looks basically the same as it does anywhere else in the body. This patient had no fracture, no visceral injury, and this was the only traumatic finding. Here we see the full extent of the soft tissue hematoma with the focus of arterial hemorrhage. Although our patient here had a history of significant trauma, hemorrhage within the rectus sheath, the retroperitoneal muscles, or other musculature can be seen with anticoagulated patients without trauma or with seemingly trivial trauma that might not be provided in the history. On this contrast enhanced CT scan, we see extensive soft tissue and skin thickening with subcutaneous edema in the ventral abdomen. More caudally, we see ill-defined gas in the subcutaneous soft tissues compatible with gas gangrene. Now here, the perineum was not involved. And it's just a reminder to serve that gas gangrene can happen anywhere. The full axial scan shows the extent of the cellulitis changes marked by green arrows. And as we go caudally, we see our ill-defined gas in the lower soft tissues compatible with gas gangrene in this diabetic patient. Note that the perineum is totally normal, so this is not Fournier's gangrene. Our last case is a hernia mesh failure. This patient underwent right inguinal hernia repair with mesh two days ago. We see a large right inguinal hernia containing fluid-filled small bowel loops, compatible with recurrent inguinal hernia, incarceration, and a closed-loop small bowel obstruction. There is mesenteric congestion of the herniated bowel loop. This ill-defined air-containing structure at the neck of the hernia represents the crumpled hernia mesh with scattered foci of intraoperatively induced air. No abscess was found intraoperatively. 
the air and edema in the overlying skin and soft tissues again tells us that the surgery was recently performed. The full axial stack shows the size of the right inguinal hernia with fluid filled small bowel loops and high grade transition points as loops enter and exit the hernia sac compatible with a closed loop small bowel obstruction. Although the bowel loops are hypoenhancing and congested, the bowel proved to be viable intraoperatively and no bowel resection was needed. Thanks again for watching.